hopefully, as we all know, Building Safety Act is a bit of legislation that came into force back in April 22. It set the foundation for building safety in the construction sector and it amended the Building Act in 1984 and subsequent secondary legislation brought through all the changes that we now see and are dealing with. And I could spend the rest of like this session just going through the Building Safety Act, but very quickly, it created the Building Safety Regulator and established its function in law. It established the concept of higher risk buildings and put in place a new system of gateways uh, to control the planning, design and construction of these buildings. It also defined new responsibilities for accountable persons and created duty holders, uh, the clients, the principal contractor and the principal designer. And importantly, it requires all individuals and organisations working on projects to be able to demonstrate their competency to do so. And that's quite a key thing. There's some, lots of other little bits and bobs like golden thread, mandatory occurrence reporting and building control regulation, but we won't go into them. But if we focus on the higher risk buildings, then we've got the definition is um, a building above 18 metres in height or seven storeys that contains at least two residential units or as a hospital or as a care home. So that sort of positions these buildings, they are higher risk of life safety issues should anything happen. And it's for all elements of the building regulations, not just fire safety elements. Um, and what the Building Safety Act did is created a separate pathway for these higher risk buildings to go through their design, sorry, their planning, their design and their construction. And that's separate for standard non-HRB buildings, which keep going through the, the same pathway that we know through planning and um, building control. So the HRBs only go through these gateways. And the first one is at gateway one is at planning. So at the planning stage, you have to demonstrate a basic understanding of the fire safety uh, for that building when it, in its planning application. So things like access for the fire brigade, number of stair cores, high level design criteria like that. Um, and once you've got planning, you then go into gateway two. And this is where the real change lies. A gateway two submission is a detailed design submission demonstrating how that entire building complies with every aspect of building regulations. It's a fundamental difference from a set of planning drawings and some nice pretty elevations with a bit of text. It is a very in-depth design, it is time consuming, it is costly to do and it has been difficult for us to do. I'm not going to bear any bones about it. It has been a learning curve for us all. And that is a stop-go gateway. So you cannot start on sites without Gateway 2 being approved. So it's, legally, it's illegal to do so. So you have to get Gateway 2 approval. And then you move on to Gateway 3, which is this, uh, fundamentally just demonstrating that you've delivered what you've set out to do in Gateway 2. So if you say it's going to be green in Gateway 2, it's got to be green when you deliver it in Gateway 3. Um, and at the end of that, you get your completion certificates. And if you don't get your completion certificates, the end user can't occupy your building. So these gateways really control the flow of projects th through the system for these higher risk buildings. So our project at uh, the stage in Luton is HRB. It's three large residential blocks. Two of the blocks are linked together. It has 292 homes across the blocks and is 10 stories in height. So one could say it's a classic high risk building in, in its uh, conception. So we're working with the customer, Luton Borough Council, through the SCF framework, and that allowed us to get appointed to work up the detailed design and take the project through what is our first full Gateway 2 submission. So you know, we're definitely on a journey, uh, as is a you know, principal contractor, and we'll see the team uh, and, uh, and our customer as well. So and we had to then obviously choose a team, select our consultant partners who are going to work with us. Um, and we've obviously, we've been used our existing supply chain, worked trusted partners who we know can deliver, know have the competency to work on these types of buildings. Um, we then obviously picked our principal designer with our employer and the employer appointed the principal designer. And we could probably spend another half an hour talking about that, but probably for another session. But in my view, it's the right way to do it. But I'm sure other people have got different views. Um, and we also selected some of our manufacturer partners. So when we're looking at the initial design, we're thinking we need to create our submission. We need that support, that um, CPD elements of design, contractor proposed, uh, contractor designed portions, sorry. And um, we need to name products. And when we're looking at naming products and naming systems to demonstrate to the regulator how those will comply, we go straight back to our supply chain system, our yellow book, 
our design bible and our friends qualifier are front and center in that have been a big supporter for what we're trying to do um, uh, in understanding and getting better fire safety into our buildings um, one of the key things that the team had to do was set up and decide what level of information we were going to finish at and submit to the the regulator and that that's a difficult thing because there's no guidance out there the, the regulator says give us everything and it's like well what do you mean by everything because there's an entire there's a lot um and that did cause us some problems and still causing us problems now and the challenges that we have to face we effectively ended up making two separate submissions so the the two joined blocks is one submission and the standalone block is a separate submission that then went to um, uh, the regulator with two sets of fees and all that good stuff and ended up being looked at by two, one multidisciplinary team but two separate fire engineers looking at it. And so we have two different sets of eyes looking at effectively the same design rationale which we're still going through that process. We're quite interesting to see how different, different people are looking at our evidence and our information and our uh, explanation of our route to compliance. Um, we ended up submitting over 900 documents that took several days physically to upload, so that in its, as an administration task in itself and not to be underestimated. Um, we made our submission back in July and then we held our breath for 12 weeks, uh, which is the statutory period for determination for a gateway to. Um, and then, as we fully expected, we got a request for an extension by the regulator for another four weeks and six weeks for the second one. And we were expecting this because if you remember in the press, they were dealing with some uh, failures for building um, control bodies who have gone bust and they have to step in and go and sort out live projects. So they said that they've gonna have some struggle with capacity. So we're expecting this to happen. We obviously agreed to the extension as I can't believe anyone wouldn't. Um, because with the obvious outcome that you will just get determined and rejected. Um, and we received our first formal response uh, from the regulator in early October. And now we're in dialogue with the parties responding to their comments and queries and us you know, very hopeful for a positive result going forward. Thank you, Graham. It's a good, very good overview. And I guess it's fair to say you can't do it as you've alluded to without your without your supply chain, without your consultants and design team. Does anyone else want to chip in and Yeah, I mean I guess the, the obvious point is um, bringing forward that technical design much earlier into the process. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's going to lead to a fundamental shift to the way the procurement process works. Yeah. So I think maybe design teams and construction teams are probably at the first what hit of that wave. Mm. But I think for the commercial teams that perhaps sit behind that, that there's a big learning curve for them and for clients in yeah. terms of what it's going to mean to procure a contractor, to procure mm. services. So, I mean, the whole thing is a learning journey for everyone. But I think that pulling that detail into a much earlier time frame yeah is a real fundamental shift. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Anything to add to that? No. Yeah. I, say, I think that's a, a really interesting point talking about de design and build. I think is a, there's gonna be a fundamental change in, it shouldn't really be about design as you build, it's design then build. And so I think that's gonna be a, a challenge for the industry, but in some ways I think it's gonna, certainly for principal contractors, it's probably gonna de-risk projects because you're gonna have a lot more information to work with yeah. at the point of tendering and so, there will be a fundamental shift and there will be some, some, some risk moving around, but fundamentally it should ultimately de-risk projects across the board. Yeah, just, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, just to echo that, that, um, you know, one, certainly as a fire engineer, one of the, the big frustrations with uh, the industry has been designing to a fixed fact on the ground, you know, the building was being built and where issues were raised by building control or even by the fire engineers, that it was too late and we were retrospectively trying to justify things. And actually having these gateways should be a massive benefit to the industry, but it is bringing a lot of extra burden to the whole process, you know, that you've really got to get all your ducks in the row, you've got to have all your information, you've got to have everything fully aligned before you ever even think about making that submission.